Our presentation today involves contributions from Dr. Scott Radlowski and Dr. Jeffrey Stano. Scott is a physical scientist in the Satellite Climate Studies branch and is co-located with the Cooperative Institute for Climate and Satellites in Maryland. He is the NESDA subject matter expert on lightning and co-lead of the GLM Algorithm Working Group and is involved in the evaluation of various operational lightning products. Jeffrey is a senior scientist with ENSCO working with NASA's Short-Term Prediction Research and Transition Center, or SPORT, in Huntsville, Alabama. He is a total lightning and GLM subject matter expert as part of the GOZAR Proving Ground and is the GOZAR Satellite Liaison for the GLM. Both have extensive experience with the brand new GLM and its applications, and we're very happy to have them joining us today. Thanks for sharing your expertise, Scott and Jeffrey. We'll turn it over to Scott to get started. Well, thank you for the introduction, Amy. That'll save me some time on my first or second slide here. Uh, as was mentioned, Jeffrey and I are both very excited to have this opportunity to discuss the geostationary lightning mapper with you. Uh, this instrument has been in preparation for quite some time, and uh, Jeffrey and I have been working on it for about a decade now. So as you can see, the introduction, most of this was covered already, uh, but I went to Ohio State for my undergraduate and then received my master's and PhD from Florida State. And um, one thing I didn't mention was the, I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Maryland where I teach mesoscale meteorology. And so then Jeffrey, most of the stuff was covered there. He did both his uh, bachelor's and PhD at Florida State and master's from Oklahoma University. And the one big thing I wanted to point out here is that Jeffrey and I are both uh, proud alumni of the Henry Fuelberg Lab at Florida State University. Uh, we're not alone, though. I think there's over 90 of us that have graduated his lab over the years, and so I just wanted to make sure I acknowledged uh, the contributions he made for both Jeffrey and I. So we're going to start things off with a poll question, kind of get things warmed up. Uh, we'll go ahead and just kind of gauge your experience. So the question, poll question number one is, do you have experience working with lightning data? And choice A is yes, B, no or C, yes, but not satellite-based lightning data. All right, quite a mixture. So we could see uh, no, no is the biggest one, uh, but next to that is yes, but not satellite-based lightning data. And so we'll make sure to make that distinction for you here. Uh, and then we also have uh, yes is 25% uh, or so. So all right, well, thank you for contributing to the poll question. We'll have a couple more of those as we go. Uh, just go ahead and jump right into lightning detection methods. And so what this is going to do is kind of uh, make that distinction that we set out on the last slide. And so traditionally, most lightning detection networks are ground-based lightning detection networks, and they work by observing radio waves that are generated by lightning. And so these radio waves vary from the low frequency all the way up to the very high frequency. And so the first graph that I've shown on the, or picture I've shown on the top right here kind of depicts how lightning is detected using uh, LF through VHF uh, radio waves. So the VHF very high frequency, we get very detailed 3D structure of lightning flashes, but it covers a very small area uh, because it works in line of sight. The LF and VLF networks can uh, detect lightning globally depending on how strong the flash is because it is able to rely on these uh, reflections from the between the ionosphere and the surface. So what we're going to talk about today is space-based lightning sensors, and they work by observing the optical lightning emissions at cloud top. And so what I've shown here is kind of a combination of the two. On the bottom here, this is a, a cross-section view of a storm over Washington, D.C., and what you're seeing, those white channels, are actually lightning channels uh, that are depicted in three, three dimensions. And what I've provided just above that, this uh, the image here with blue and white, before the GLM was launched, the only lightning sensor that we had in orbit was on the tropical rainfall measurement mission and that's in low earth orbit so what it was able to do is provide 90 second snapshots as it uh, flew over certain spots on earth and so by using that we've shown you what an lma flash looks like so that's the white dots here and then what it would look like from space and so you can see the footprint that is observed from space is much larger than the structure depicted in the vhf lma data and so what this has to do is optical diffusion of the light as it reaches cloud top. So move, moving on to introduce you a little bit further to the geostationary lightning mapper. Uh, the reason we're so excited about it is that the, the GO-16 GLM is the first lightning mapper in geostationary orbit. 
It was launched in November of 2016. It reached orbit about 10 days later. The first science product was produced on the 14th of January, uh, but there were some changes that needed to be made to the ground system software. And so really the first working science data from the GLM was avail available on the 24th of April. Then we have various status reviews. There's three of them in particular. We've already went through the beta status review, and so this opened up the data to flow over what's called the GRB, or GOES rebroadcast. Then we have two more planned reviews. One is provisional, that's in January 2018, and then final, which will be in June of 2018. And each of these has a set of benchmarks that need to be made before the data can be declared provisional or final. And another thing that's exciting is the GLMs on the GOES 16, the GOES S, T, and U will provide coverage all the way up through the year of 2036. And so what I've shown on the bottom here, this is a uh, picture that was, shown, that was taken just before the launch of the GLM. And this probably shows between one-fifth or one-tenth of all the people that have worked on the GLM over the years. So it's a, quite a team effort to, to launch this new technology. So then a lot of words on this slide, but I really wanted to hit why the GLM. We already mentioned that there's ground-based lightning detection networks. Why do you need a GLM? Well, one of the key details is that it provides continuous full disk total lightning measurements. And so by total lightning, I mean that the GLM detects both intracloud lightning and cloud to ground lightning. And so that's an important distinguish. Some of the ground-based networks that cover the largest areas really only detect the cloud to ground flashes. The, just some basic characteristics of the GLM. It is able to detect greater than 70% of all flashes, and that's averaged over 24 hours. And I'll get into the, that distinction a little bit later. The GLM provides coverage to 54 degrees north and south with a 20-second product latency. And this is really remarkable. The satellite is able to observe lightning, uh, do its filtering on the spacecraft, send that data down to Wallops Island, Virginia, and that data is processed and sent out to users all within 20 seconds. So it's really remarkable the technology that uh, came into play with this sensor. So in terms of why we use the GLM, we use it to detect electrically active storms. And the total lightning is key here because the intercloud lightning typically precedes the cloud to ground. Uh, and this probably isn't the only time I'm going to make this distinction, but I want to definitely make clear while the GLM sees both intercloud and cloud to ground lightning, it doesn't distinguish between the two. Uh, and so uh, we'll get into the repercussions of that later, but it's just important to know when you're working with the data. Uh, forecasters will use the GLM to determine the aerial extent of the lightning threat. They will use it to tr track convective cells that are embedded in larger features. They can identify strengthening and weakening storms by looking at changes in the amount of lightning. They can monitor convective storm mode and storm evolution, and so they can see whether a, a storm is transitioning from a supercell to an MCS or um, an isolated pulse storm to more of a supercell structure. It really helps to supplement radar data where coverage is poor. So, for instance, out west where you have beam blockage of the radar. Uh, and then it allows us to characterize storms as they transition offshore out of radar range. We can distinguish thunderstorms from rain-only over area, rain only areas. And then a lot of the animations I'll show today will provide insights into tropical cyclone intensity changes. So go into the second poll question here. And this poll question is, have you seen GLM data or imagery? And choice A is data, B is imagery, C is both, and D is neither. All right, well, that's encouraging. We see that a, a lot of folks, um, there's a fair amount that have seen neither, um, a, a smaller percentage that have seen both, but the largest percentage are folks that have actually seen the GLM imagery. And so that's, that's encouraging, that's good to hear. Uh, but we're going to show you the latest and greatest. Uh, so you will definitely be able to answer yes to that question after today. So here is the, um, the visualization that I was referencing. And unfortunately, the webinar doesn't quite do this justice. You'll see a lot of jumpingness. But these slides will be made available to you uh, after, after the fact. And so what we're showing here is this is actually the, the GLM data and the ABI data. And so what you're seeing is the the brightening of the clouds is what we would call GLM events, and the yellow is what we call GLM groups. And I'll get into the definition of that later, uh, but this is the first of three of these I'm gonna show, and they'll depict all the way from Hurricane Harvey through Hurricane Maria. So just to introduce how the GLM detects lightning, I've shown you an example here from a lightning imaging sensor flash, but it helps to describe this point. So the GLM, what it does is it 
creates a, a background image every two minutes. And so it takes an image of the whole field of view every two minutes, and then it looks for changes in brightness relative to this background every two milliseconds. And so when it sees something that exceeds the detection threshold, it calls it an event. Uh, so these are the illuminated pixels. Then we have filters that go through and determine the likelihood that these events are real lightning. And the ones that get through go into what's called a lightning cluster filter algorithm that will combine these events into groups and then groups into flashes. And I'll get into the definition of what those are on this very next slide. But the animation, what I'm showing you here is the brightening that you see, kind of the white pulses, the clouds brightening. That's what we would call in a GLM event. It's the base unit of observation. And then what are being connected, you can see this now, those are the GLM groups that are being co connected with a line. And this is all part of one exceptional Liz flash that lasted 0.8 seconds. And so this kind of shows you why it's called a lightning mapper and not a lightning detector. So to just briefly tell you the definitions of, a GL, of the GLM uh, entities, the event is the occurrence of a single pixel except exceeding the detection threshold during one two millisecond frame. A group is one or more simultaneous GLM events observed in adjacent, so neighboring or diagonal pixels. And then the next step up are flashes. And so flashes are one or more sequential groups separated by less than 330 milliseconds and 16.5 kilometers. And these numbers were determined using the lightning imaging sensor, trying to sort out what is actually a lightning flash. So you may say, why do we need all three of these? And so I put this, this bullet in there for you to kind of clarify what, what you might use these for. So the GLM flash rates are most closely tied to the updraft and storm evolution. So if you're looking at trends in the storms, you really want to look at the flashes. The event locations best depict the spatial extent of the lightning, so the aerial threat. And then the GLM groups are most similar to ground-based network strokes and pulses. And so when you're making network intercomparisons, the groups are very helpful. So the other very important thing in terms of the definitions of events and groups is telling you where they're located. And so the, the radiance or the brightness is recorded for each illuminated pixel. And then the flash and the group locations are actually what are termed radiance-weighted centroids. So they consider the, all of the constituent events and groups. And so the near-right image here, I've shown an idealized example of what you would call a GLM group. So it's one two millisecond snapshot in time. All the white cells here are, um, are GLM pixels that are lit up. And then what it does is it con considers all the brightness from all those pixels and it finds where it's brightest. And so that's where your group will be located. And then the same thing is done for flashes. And so on the far right here, what I've shown is an example of a flash that has two groups and, and many events. And you can see that the location of the flash is the radiance weighted centroid. And so it doesn't necessarily need to fall immediately along the lightning channel, um, but it is within the footprint. So going on to poll question number three, we finally start testing some of the stuff we've already uh, covered. So the question, poll question number three is, which are most useful? GLM events, groups, or flashes? Wonderful. The vast majority of you say that it depends on the application. Uh, the other two selections were events and groups, and I imagine those came from folks that are uh, interested in one particular application or another, because you could argue that if you only are working in an airport, then maybe the events are all that matter to you. So thank you for the contributing to that poll. We'll go ahead and move on to GLM limitations, which I, uh, I put some more of this really neat imagery next to it to try to um, try to make things sound better. No, I'm just kidding. The um, GLM limitations that we'd like to note are that there's diurnal performance variations, so it's easier to detect lightning at night, and this is kind of for obvious reasons. Uh, but what we'd like to point out is that at any given time, you have uniform detection across the field of view. So as long as it's night in your whole field of view or, or day, you're going to have uniform detection efficiency. Uh, the, the real big one here is that it's a new instrument undergoing an extended calibration and validation effort. So there, there are definitely data quality issues that remain, and the performance will vary as the instrument and algorithms are optimized. And so Jeffrey and I both work on that aspect of things, and so we're doing our best to communicate that to the users. And then one last one here, Jeffrey will talk more about the applications of lightning, but in certain environments, high shear, low cape, shallow convection, the effectiveness of what we term lightning jumps as indicators of impending severe weather are reduced or eliminated. And so Jeffrey will go a little bit more into that, um, but it has to be kind of known by forecasters. There's environments where this may not be as helpful.
So then, uh, just my last sli couple slides here, uh, we'll talk about research applications. The GO16 really opens the door to a tremendous variety of new research topics, and users really are encouraged to get creative and share their findings. I've shown one example here. We had a student visit from Brazil this summer, and she brought her high-speed camera. And on the bottom there, what you're seeing is 13, a 13-stroke 13 flash that she caught on her uh, camera at, I think, 2,500 frames per second. And what we've shown above that, this is actually the very same flash as seen by the lightning mapping array. So you see the 3D channel. It doesn't show it coming all the way to ground because the sensors are line of sight. Uh, but we know it came to ground because of the high-speed video. And then on the top right panel, this is the same flash as seen from geostationary orbit. And so it's really remarkable you get these different perspectives. And so this, these uh, pictures I've shown here came from a NOAA emergency, Emerging Technologies poster. And so what we showed uh, in this presentation is the idea that we can use these radio lightning measurements, lightning imagery from orbit, and then also 360 degree and high speed videos. And so by combining all these together, we get a very unique perspective on the lightning and just one example, the student that was visiting this summer, she's trying to estimate the amount of current flowing through a channel based on its brightness. And so this all comes together to provide really neat research opportunities. Okay, we have a, a poll question here to kind of gauge your interest. So poll question number four is, which areas of GLM research interest you? A, lightning occurrence, climatology. B, lightning or cloud physics. C, severe weather or lightning jump. D, lightning detection modeling, or E, other. And if you choose E, please type in the web webinar chat box. Wonderful, quite a variety. I like to see that. One of the, the most traditional one has been the severe weather and the lightning jump that has the most uh, measurable uh, impact on society or forecasters. But the lightning occurrence in climatology, that's where I'm most interested. Uh, we have a light of lightning detection and modeling. I assume some of that's data assimilation and then lightning and cloud physics, which is a really interesting topic. So great. It's good to see the variety there. And Scott, two people typed in, um, one typed in lightning and hurricanes and someone else typed in operational use. Great. Yeah, that rounds them out right there. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again for your contributions. Uh, this is my last slide here and then we'll get into Jeffrey's portion of the talk. Uh, this is just kicking off the oper operational applications, uh, which was one of the things typed in for the last question. Um, really, the efforts continue to develop the best tools possible for National Weather Service forecasters. What I've shown on the left here, this is an example of what we would call a lightning jump. And so this is before the GLM was in orbit. We used other data sets to kind of uh, make something that we thought it would look like. But you'll see right here a brightening of the lightning. So that's an uptick in lightning, and then that's a tornado. And the same thing happened up here. So you have the updraft strengthening, suddenly you get more collisions of particles, you get more charge, you get more lightning, and then 20 or so minutes later you get a tornado that follows. And so that's the example of the lightning jump I wanted to show you. On the right here, this is something that isn't available to National Weather Service forecasters yet. It's still very much in the uh, proof of concept phase, but we hope that someday this will be a tool that's available. What we're showing here is what's called GLM storms or areas. And so what you're seeing is individual GLM events, groups, and flashes. And if you take all these and you composite them over 20 seconds, it gives you a very good definition of the boundaries of what a human may call a convective cell. And so what we'd like to do is implement this in real time and, and give the forecasters the opportunity to interact with this data more closely. And so uh, with that, I think we're going to go to the next poll question, which Jeffrey will take, and he'll, he'll lead from here. And as we do that, uh, poll question number five. Uh, the question is, which operational GLM application is of most interest? A, a, the lightning jump or a rapid increase in lightning flash rate. B, lightning safety, such as outdoor vocation and recreation activities. C, situational awareness, providing the big picture perspective. D, aviation and maritime in route planning and storm monitoring. Or E, wildfires, such as for early detection. Okay, excellent. This is a, a good a good range of uh, results that we're seeing through here. And that really kind of reinforces what uh, both Scott and I have seen in terms of our working with uh, emergency managers, operational forecasters, and the research community, that there's a wide variety of interest in, in trying to use not just lightning data, but also GLM data going forward. So uh, although we won't be able to show an example of everything uh, in these next couple of slides, hopefully we kind of can show a quick overview of some of the ideas of what we're going to be doing with the operational data. 
Uh, so with that, I'll just kind of uh, jump into uh, the next slide here and talk about some of the operational applications for not just total lightning data, but for the geostationary lightning mapper data. Uh, from the work that we've done in the past, working with ground-based lightning mapping arrays, uh, kind of being used as a precursor to the GLM, uh, forecasters and research scientists, we've really documented a wide range of use uh, for these lightning data in operations. Uh, again, we see that interest in that last poll question as well, that there's a, lot, there's a lot of interest. How can we use these data? So far, there are kind of three main applications working uh, with these data, with lightning. The number one has been the lightning jump. As Scott mentioned in his, pre his last slide, these are really rapid increases in total lightning that they're signifying that severe weather is likely in a particular storm cell. This really helps support warning decision support. Uh, so if you're an operational forecaster, you might be kind of sitting on the fence. You're looking at the radar signature, and the radar signature may be kind of ambiguous. It may not be giving you a, uh, the direct answer of what you want to look for. The lightning data might be that extra observational tool that you need to kind of really make that decision yes or no. Another one is lightning safety. Uh, in particular, the fact that we can see the intracloud lightning, this is often going to precede the first cloud to ground observation. In addition, beyond just a point observation that you see with the National Lightning Detection Network data, the geostationary lightning mapper provides the spatial extent of lightning. So you can see just how far lightning is extending beyond its initiation point. I have a couple examples of that through here, which might be pretty uh, interesting to look at at that point. Then lastly, there's situational awareness. Essentially, rapidly updating GLM data lets you kind of investigate what's going on inside convective storms both for their development and evolution. And we can see this throughout the entire GO-16 field of view. This is really kind of very useful to kind of see what's going on, and that's going to go into the physical reasoning, which I'll talk about in the next slide. For our National Weather Service uh, forecasters, they're working with a system called AWIPS to view the GLM data. And there's going to be other ways to visualize data going forward for other non-weather service users. So one thing I'd like to kind of mention uh, in terms of the operational applications is what is the physical reasoning for total lightning data? Why is this useful and how can we use it? Overall, the physical reasoning for total lightning indicates that if you have a stronger, more voluminous updraft in the mixed phase region, that means you're going to get more total lightning. Essentially, getting to the mixed phase region, that's where you have supercooled liquid water droplets, ice crystals. You start getting all that bouncing together. That is kind of your generation source for electrification inside a storm. If you're not reaching that mixed phase region, you're not going to see a lot of lightning at that point. So what's really useful here is this can be used as a proxy for kind of the strength of a given thunderstorm, which is why we see this for severe weather. The work that we've been doing, it builds upon the lightning mapping array networks, where we've used these as kind of, they have very small domains, but they do see total lightning just like the geostationary lightning mapper. So from this, we're able to reinforce that physical reasoning and develop these examples that we've used for training. The next step that we want to do, and I want to kind of show this here as we look at the next image here, the lower part of this image, lower left, we're looking at the radar reflectivity roughly around 6,100 meters up. This was in the mixed phase region for the given storm that we're seeing in the upper left part of the image here. What we need to do as we go forward is we want to make sure that we connect what we see with the GLM to radar observations. Particularly for operational forecasters, uh, that is kind of the, their biggest tool in operations, looking at radar. And many of us are very familiar with looking at radar. If you're able to make that connection, you see where the main core of the GLM observations are corresponding to the main updraft of the mixed phase region, you start creating trust in the data. It fits the physical conceptual model. That way, if you start trusting the data when you see it with radar, then you can start trusting GLM data when you're in a data sparse region where you may not have any available radar. Now, going through here, uh, I'm now moving to a quick animation. We're centered over uh, most of the state of Florida at this point. Uh, in the upper left-hand side, uh, this is kind of an AWIPS display. We're looking at the group densities in the upper left, uh, also looking at kind of the flash points and the event densities, which we said are the best for kind of the spatial extent. That's showing the corresponding radar data in the upper right and the advanced baseline imager infrared imagery on the lower right. I just want you to kind of take a moment to kind of look at the animation through here, see how it's evolving. Notice how you see these storms uh, by Jacksonville, how they're kind of pulsing. They go from very low values to start seeing very bright values, indicating the strengthening of that updraft. See that over parts of central Florida? And also, look at the extent of the lightning. You're not seeing just a point source. You see lightning actually extending uh, many miles away from the core of the thunderstorm. So I'll move ahead here and go beyond just this uh, kind of animation 
and look at a uh, more of a still photo at this point. So if we go kind of to that next slide here, we can move forward to the next slide. There we go. Uh, as we're looking at this, I want you to draw your attention to some storms near Orlando, Florida. This is very close to uh, the Orlando International Airport. And there are a couple of things that really stand out here at this point. First of all, you can see uh, right through here the bright values indicating there's more groups and more events in this particular case. That's indicating this is a very strong thunderstorm in this particular region. And that is kind of corresponding to the radar reflectivity that we're seeing in and around the Orlando area and the Orlando International Airport. What's interesting is when you look at the advanced baseline imager data, you do see a kind of this broad shield of cold cloud tops, definitely indicating that you have strong storms underneath. But both the GLM data and the radar data help give you an opportunity to kind of almost peer beneath the clouds and see where exactly are the strongest cores being observed. At the same time, I want to also draw your attention to this feature through here. We have this flash that kind of really originates kind of around uh, downtown Orlando and then extends about 50 or 60 miles eastward, uh, kind of southeastward, towards uh, just south of the Florida Space Coast. And when you see that, really that's lightning going to a very weak reflectivity region. So it's demonstrating that even though a lightning flash can initiate uh, in the strong convective region, it can extend many, many miles away from that core of the storm. That's one of the big things for lightning safety is that uh, lightning data, uh, lightning observations, you can see this, but not with the point data. Uh, particularly with when you're looking at for individuals who are struck by lightning, many times it's struck towards the very beginning of a storm or the very end of the storm. When it's raining, no one wants to go outside. But when you see a lot of lightning going on uh, kind of at that point, again, they're not going outside. But they don't see just how far the lightning can go at the beginning of the storm. They think, oh, the threat has passed. I don't have to worry about it. It's safe to go outside. At the same time, too, uh, we can also show how the GLM identifies the strongest storm cores. And as we said already, we can see the spatial extent. And as we look through here, I'm uh, kind of looking at these very small flashes up towards Jacksonville through here. Uh, basically, it's just one flash kind of in that region. And this is kind of showing where, again, you can see some lightning data before the initial cloud ground observations. And we're also seeing that in a very weak reflectivity region. So there's not a whole lot going on. You would not expect to see a lot of uh, lightning in this, but there it is. There is a couple of, little bit of lightning through here. At the same time, you see these very bright, almost bullseye features in the GLM data. Those are kind of, uh, kind of what you would kind of see as a uh, lightning jump is occurring, these strong bullseye features developing, indicating that a very strong storm is developing at this point. So this is another tool in the forecaster's toolbox to indicate what's happening at this point. What is this storm doing? Is it strengthening? Is it weakening? Uh, those types of features. At the same time, too, from an aviation perspective, while this storm may not become a severe thunderstorm from the traditional sense, in terms of high winds, tornado, or hail, it may be producing enough uh, turbulence that aircraft don't want to fly too near that. At the same time, another kind of uh, long flash example, this is going up into uh, Minnesota and just uh, kind of northwest of Wisconsin. We look through here, I've circled the GLM observations kind of across the region through here. And the background is kind of a, an ABI image, kind of showing where the convective clouds are. If we go one minute further, we now see that there's this very large lightning flash, extends towards the kind of the north northwest. It's about 160 kilometers away from the original initiation point. That's well over 100 miles from the initiation point. If we look at that radar reflectivity region in the upper right, we see that the storms initiated kind of near Duluth, Minnesota, but the lightning extended well into that stratiform region. So again, very important to see what's going to happen through there. I'll switch over to an animation at this point, and this animation shows one hour worth of data, and each frame is one minute of data. And what you're seeing is that that long flash, that wasn't an isolated case. We're seeing many of these long flashes occurring over and over and over again. So it's really kind of a strong feature of the GLM. Instead of being limited to the very short-range lightning mapping arrays, we can now see this over the entire field of view of the GLM. And lastly, kind of reinforcing this, because uh, we're kind of running out of a little bit of time here, I just want to kind of show we're looking at data in a, in a data sparse region. We're out over the Gulf of Mexico. Once again, in the background, you see the advanced baseline imager, uh, kind of infrared imagery at this point. This is kind of giving you an idea of where the coldest cloud tops are. But when you overlay that with the GLM data, you start seeing, oh, here's where the storms really are the most concentrated, where the most intense storms are. It's almost like kind of a, a proxy for the radar imagery. So you can see where the main storm cores are developing. You can also see a long flash extending behind the line of storms. And also, this is a fairly well-traveled region for air route, uh, air route traffic. So you can actually look for gaps within the storms to where you can route tra air traffic through this region. 
And so with that, that kind of brings us to the summary of what we've been talking about here today, both Scott and myself. Overall, the GLM is the first ever lightning mapper in a geostationary orbit. So we're really excited by the opportunities and potential that the GLM can provide us. As I said in the next bullet here, this provides continuous full disk observations of total lightning measurements. Before to look at total lightning, we were either looking at very small networks like the lightning mapping arrays or networks that had a kind of a severe issue trying to look at total lightning offshore. So now the GLM gives us a really good opportunity to look at that. Now GLM is doing this from a couple of ways. It's looking at the optical emissions and it gives us events, groups, and flashes. Each one gives us a different way to visualize the lightning, the events for spatial extent, groups looking at more of that stroke data, and flash is kind of more, uh, more readily understood by individuals what they're looking at. Now, there have been some data quality issues, as Scott mentioned before, but those issues are improving. In fact, there should be some new updates coming up fairly soon. And as I said, we're looking forward to a lot of research opportunities that come out with GO-16 being operational. That includes both the Advanced Baseline Imager and the Geostationary Lightning Mapper. Now, our efforts are going to continue to create the best tools for possible uh, use by forecasters, and this includes National Weather Service forecasters and other individuals who may not be using the AWIP system environment. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, both on behalf of Scott and myself, uh, Comet, for the opportunity to present today. So thank you.